Okay, here we go. Second annual question and answer that I'm doing. And what I do and how do I get this information and um, why do I do this? Well, many of you next semester are going into capstone and a lot of it is thinking. And it's not just memorizing information anymore. It is a lot about understanding something and applying it to different topics. And I think at the end of pediatrics, it's a great time to do this. What I do is I go back to all your old HESIs and I last three of them actually. And I look at those topics that are there. And yeah. in those topics, I um, bring up what I say, let's do some questions about it. I mean, what does it mean? Now, Steph, if you could put your full name there, I could give you credit, okay? Let's go ahead and let's pull up our PowerPoint. Again, as we're doing this, please, any questions, stop me. Ask questions as we're going. Uh, don't ever be afraid doing that. I do not mind um, if I'm talking about something or somebody, just please, I want you all to understand this. This isn't about me understanding it. This is about you understanding it. So <clears throat> here we go. Only 27 slides that we're working on. Give me my hug, baby. Have fun. Enjoy camp. So here we go. So let's first of all, let's talk about children. Let's talk about nutrition. Well, what have I always said about nutrition? Remember, it's the most important thing with children. And the problem with nutrition is, is things like reflux, like having any sort of disease with the bowels that you're losing nutrition uh, due to diarrhea, right? So these would be a concern in any age child. Because I mean, through pediatrics, you're growing the whole way through, right? You don't get nutrition, what's gonna happen? You're not going to grow. And cognitively, you could be delayed. I mean, this is one of the reasons why we do height and weight on every visit. So in IBS, we need to be still concerned and make sure they get nutrition. Again, monitoring height and weight. In the infant, that child who's spitting up constantly, what's going on with that? Aren't they losing their nutrition? So what do we need to do? Well, we need to do a treatment. Now, why do we put rice cereal in the formula? Why? It thickens it. Weighs it thickens it. Down. it. Yes. Our... Because then it will sit down. Yeah, it's going to sit down. And yeah, it can prevent aspiration because now you're not vomiting. So it's all really good reasons why we do that. And again, why do you think we weigh these children so much? Especially infants. You go in at two weeks, two months, four months, six months. Really important, not only all those immunizations, but we are also concerned about nutrition. Now, nutrition, and we're talking about all different sort of conditions a child can have, right? For instance, if you had a child who has really bad osteomyelitis and they're home with a pick line, right? They're getting IV antibiotics. You know, food and nutrition can help them feel better. And what they recommend is fruits, vegetables, whole grain breads, low fat dairy, beans, meat, fish, all of these things can really help. Um, and it helps with nutrition and with healing. So nutrition is not only for growth cognition, it helps also with healing. Now, a kid is uh, a little obese. What would you do? Now, if a kid is obese, um, they do recommend do at least a three day history. What's their diet? What are they eating? Are they eating the proper foods? Are they getting the proper nutrition? That fruits, that vegetables, all of those things. And another thing is, are they um, active? You know, a lot of kids today, and I, I see it with all my grandchildren, they love to be on that little, whatever it's called, the switch, right? And they're always sitting there. And are they up and moving? No. So um, very important that we evaluate 
and encourage physical activity. Um, it could be swimming or it could be out playing softball, baseball, soccer, whatever. And of course, you know, if they have it in school, that does help. Okay, you have a kid who has celiac. What would you take from that lunch tray? What can't they eat? Wheat, rye, barley, and oats. And what food would you see? Gluten. Okay, but what type of foods like cake, right? Yeah, bread, bread, crackers, and anything breaded, right? So those are things that um, as nurses, we're going to have to make sure that, okay, they have uh, celiac disease, they have gluten intolerance, and it's wheat, rye, barley, oats. Any of that stuff can't be on the tray, or it's really, really going to be um, putting a lot of pain in that little child's tummy. And I've seen these kids celiac disease make a mistake and they suffer and we, they don't have to. Is, celiac, is pasta included, Professor? Be, uh, Absolutely, it is oh. pasta, unless it's like a rice pasta. Okay. And today we're lucky. Um, there are much better choices for celiac children and it will say gluten-free on them, which I think is awesome. Now, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, they didn't have it. So the okay. kids today have a better uh, chance with it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> they can have rice, is that what you're saying? Oh, they can have rice, oh, absolutely. It's not wheat, rye, um, oats or barley. It's rice, it's a great choice. Give them a rice cake, put peanut butter on it. And that would be like a sandwich, right? And there's other choices. There's rice bread, potato breads, a lot of them that are gluten-free. Diaper or the white patches in the tongue. And what is that caused by? Fungus. Fungal. And how do we treat it? Nice day. Can't we just scratch it off? Get rid of no. it? No. It's actually be very painful. So you have a mother calling up or coming to be seen. It says, my baby has this white patch and I can't get it off they're gonna need medication for that, for sure. And the name of it is Nystatin. You know, older kids, they swish and swallow. Younger kids, we just paint it on their tongue usually. Now, one of the things that we don't think about is, you know, we get phone calls from parents all the time, uh, whether it's ERs or doctor's offices, urgent cares, and they're saying, my baby's not sleeping well at night. Now, we could think maybe they need to be fed, Maybe that's it, or maybe the reflux or something, but don't rule out diaper rash. Because a kid that's butt is raw and red, like that picture there, is not going to be sleeping once they stool or, or have urine, right? And it's going to burn. So we want to make sure that they protect it with some sort of emollient cream to protect it, and they're going to need frequent changing. So we introduce foods at six months why why not at three months the gi tract isn't mature enough to take it right and then what is our one big concern about introducing foods and allergy. why do we do it mm -hmm. yeah allergies for sure so we need to take four to seven days in between introducing a new uh, type of food <clears throat> you know, what would you see? You might see a rash or you might see abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting. That's might what you see. So these are things we should teach our um, parents. Okay, infants, we're going to go into the groups and go over a couple things here, okay? So if you have a child whose head circumference is increasing, what are you going to be looking for? What do you think is going on? An Old infant. Absolutely, absolutely. This is probably hydrocephalus. So we're measuring that head and all of a sudden from yesterday to today when I did my you know, big assessment and measured the head, it's up two centimeters. Do it again, okay, it's up two centimeters. I'm gonna look, is it bulging and tense? That absolutely is extra fluid. And of course we would report that to the doctor so they can do a head ultrasound is usually what they would do first of all. One of the things that we tend to not think about is a child who has a condition which they're unable to eat. And the one I always think of 
is esophageal atresia or tracheal esophageal fistula, right? Nothing goes down, it comes back up. There's no connection to the stomach or you eat down the esophagus and it goes across that fistula into the, into the lungs. These children are gagging and choking on their own mucus. So one thing that we have to remember is to give that child the way to, that they soothe themselves, right? That pacifier. I mean, I have seen in my career, I like it, I don't like it. It's um, physicians saying pacifiers, but they have firmly believed today that a pacifier is a self-soother, it's a comforting thing for those children, and it promotes normal growth and development. I have a oh, question. Sure. Um, so I did the, the HESI preparation exam that we have on our modules due this week, and it had a question about the font mail. Okay. And I had picked the one about, it's like a 28 month old with hydrocephalus that has an open anterior fontanelle. It told me I was wrong. And the answer was um, a six month old photo to thrive that has a closed anterior fontanelle. I would have to know the whole question. And so, cause I thought I hydrocephalus would be like our main concern, especially 28 month old who's is still open. I mean, that, that is concerned. They're both a uh, concern, but a 28 month old usually probably has already had hydrocephalus for a while and it's open, okay? And it's, it's there and it's taking care of the extra fluid. Now, the younger kid has no place for that fluid to go. That kid needs something to drain it. They're gonna need that ventricular peritoneal shunt to get the fluid off because all that pressure in the brain can cause brain damage. So it is more dangerous, the younger kid. The other kid already has an outlet to let the, the pressure go away. You, you understand that? Yes. Okay, good. All right, many times you've got parents, they're on their third kid. Well, my other kids did this and this one's not doing it and they're different. Well, is that normal that all kids are different? Yeah, absolutely. You'll have some kids walking at seven months old and some kids not walking till 16 months old. Normal, absolutely normal stuff. Okay, FTT, failure to thrive. Now, this would be identified in those doctor's offices or in, you know, going to the ER, whatever. We have a consistent look at height and weight, right? And if we see a six month old who has only gained two pounds and they were born at eight pounds, that child is a failure to thrive, right? They should at least double their birth weight by six months. Now, how do we get them to gain weight? And what we do is just give a higher calorie formula, you know, or we could do fortifiers and breast milk also. It's the same thing, add calories to the same volume of fluid. Um, and they get that extra calories. You know, most formulas are 20 calories per ounce. You can go to 30 calories per ounce. So you are, you know, giving them one and a half of what they had, right? 20 plus 10 more, they're, they're getting a lot of extra calories with the same volume and they can tolerate it. To try to give them more formula, they're gonna vomit, but give the same amount extra calories, that works. So I have a question on that. Sure. Um, understanding the failure to thrive because the parent or caregivers responsible, like cutting formula in half. But what is a normal, like uh, not normal, but a physical reason while you're while they're failing to thrive? It could be metabolic. It could be absorption problems. Could be reflux. It could be diarrhea. It could be all of those things. Or maybe there's a condition like a cardiac that's burning up all the calories. Because even though there's something that explains it, it's still, they need to gain the weight because cognition, nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. Very Can good it question. Cost it? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like, you know, like they, they want to make that powdered formula last longer and give more water and less. Yes, all of that can happen. Absolutely. 
that's one of the things that unfortunately I've seen. Um, but normal kid, normal circumstance, no neglect. All we're going to do is make the calorie in that milk the same volume with more calories. And it does. It will replace what they need. Now, little toddlers, ages one to three, we know we have got to get on their level. We've got to sort of make them not scared of us because, you know, we're the bad guys. All we do is give them injections every time they go to the doctor's office, right? So they're afraid of us. So get down on their level, like sitting on the floor next to them. I like if they're on a stretcher, I'll sit below them in a chair and just start talking to them or give them a sticker or, you know, tell them I love their shirt, their shoes, something, or the freckles or the big blue eyes, whatever it is. And then when you're sitting there explaining stuff, use a doll and, or something, a, a teddy bear, a stuffed animal, anything. And I'm telling you, these children then understand what's going on. And uh, they're not going to be afraid because toddlers are just afraid of the unknown. They love routine, right? And if they're not in routine, they're really upset. And going to a doctor into a hospital, if they're not in routine, they don't know what's going on, they're afraid. So teaching them, getting on their level, show them what's going to happen. They're going to be a, a lot uh, calmer. And that's what you want. Preschoolers, you know, we're talking fine motor skills. They're going to hop on one foot. They're going to button their shirt with their fingers. So that's gross motor hopping. Fine motors is going to be the fingers, button the shirt, and speech. <clears throat> you know, infants coo and cry. That's their speech. By one year, they're saying at least mommy, daddy, or more, right? And as they get older, they should be speaking more words. And by about three years old, four years old, that's the preschool area, it should be at least four word sentences, if not more. And if not, what do we need to do? Early intervention, right? Speech therapy. Let's get them um, where they need to be. Catch them up. And as I've always said, kids catch up pretty quickly. Now, autism. We know autism is usually not diagnosed till about two to three years old. I mean, we might have clues before that. We know autism is those odd repetitive behaviors and they do it over and over and over again. You know, I've told my group about this one little boy I met in clinicals and he was not only autistic, he was Downs autistic, but he was smart because he had been in this daycare which had speech, occupational, physical therapy since birth. That kid would sit in the corner by himself, absolutely normal for these children. And he would take a fire truck and put it on a chair. Then he would take uh, another little car and put it on and another thing, put it on top. And then maybe put a sheet of something on top and then take one off, take the other off, take the other off, put the fire truck down and over up the fire truck, put the car, other car, put the thing on top, over over, over, over again. And that gives them comfort. That is autism. Now there is a question here that can be filled out. And I just wanted to bring that to your, your attention. And it's just a modified checklist for autism behaviors. And it does help um, with the diagnosis of it. And you can see we're doing that rate at two years old. <clears throat> question about the speech. Sure. Uh, I was going over the, the review for, or, or the HESI, uh, mm -hmm. practice HESI. Yeah. And there was a question they asked twice on, uh, what a two-year-old should be able to do. And one of the responses was capable of making three word sentences. The other was half of the child's speech is understandable. And, uh, Again, they asked it at two different places, and the answers were different for each in each place. You know, they should have three words, and they do understand more than they can express verbally. They're both right, Gregory. They okay. really are. It was weird because I got I them know. both wrong. Like, which one? Which one would you do? Well, which one did you choose? Well, probably it was opposite each time. Most yeah, I got them both wrong too. It was making me crazy because I, <laughs> I got them both wrong. 
because I didn't answer, you know. You know, I go to Evolve and I tell them these little things that we find and they can change those. So that speech on a three-year-old, I will definitely let Evolve know about it. It was, yeah, it was a two-year-old. Um, the two-year-old. Okie doke. Yeah, they like us to tell them when their questions are crazy or, you know, not where they should be. And that's a really good uh, example. So thank you. Okay, school-age children. What do we know about school-age children? Well, one of the kids, um, they're growing a lot at this stage. Remember, this is ages 6 to 12. So they gain a lot of weight. They are, grow a lot. Now, this is the time where all of a sudden we go, this kid now, I mean, the younger kids, a little shorter. They don't look at it that much as long as their weight is proportionate. When they get to school age, now they're looking at the height. And just simply, the first question is, well, how tall is mommy and daddy? I mean, if everybody is five foot two, this child is not going to be five foot six by 12 years old or whatever. They're just not. They're all going to be short. So remember, when you're looking at things like height, uh, with Jill, and height is the most important. Weight could be all over the place, but height. Make sure that you say, to the, well, you know, mom, I see you're short. How is daddy? Maybe they never, the nurse never saw daddy, right? So checking the normal height of all the other family members. Now, what do we do for siblings of hospitalized children? You know, their brothers in the hospital just had, you're going to say, major surgery. And you've got brothers and sisters at home. What should you do for them? Let them see them. Well, what if it's COVID? They can't. It happened. Send them cards, talk on the phone. We're lucky with FaceTime today. You know that? Yeah. We are so lucky with that today. Because, um, you know, I used to always send bows, ribbons, stickers home for the other kids. Uh, because I know how hard that is. So as a nurse, remember this as you, if you want to work beads. Because it is important. And they will appreciate it. And so will the parents because it makes them feel important. One of the things that children school age, they get a lot of tonsils, adenoids, ear tubes, right? These are commonplace surgeries and they have to go in and there are children who need more than one and they're coming in and out. What about the sickle cell child who's uh, always in and out in crisis and they have multiple hospitalizations. Um, this is part of understanding that children, we need to know if they've been in a hospital before and how did they react? I mean, how would that change the way you took care of that child? Aren't you going to say, well, I see that he had surgery before. How did he do? How did you prep that child for surgery or prep that child for a procedure? Very important. So reactions to other hospitalizations are always important when you're admitting a child for a special procedure, for surgery, or just admission to a hospital unit, okay? How were they last time or other visits here? Because it's the kid who's been there a lot who's probably going to have more fears than the kid who's never been there before. Adolescents. You know, these are the kids I call the roller coaster kids. Got to hold on, mom and dad, because they're hard to deal with. Because they're all about me, 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 and all my buddies, right? So, one of the concerns in adolescents is children with chronic uh, illnesses. Could be sickle cell, could be cystic fibrosis, could be some sort of a you know IBS of some sort. Um, they are more concerned about their buddies, you know, their friends. And one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that we understand that and that we give them time with their friends. You know, uh, again, I said FaceTime is great. Fit it into the schedule, you know, and as nurses, you see them on their phones. Well, can't be all the time, but um making sure that we give adolescents that what they need to make them feel good. Because a kid is going in the hospital for a long time. Um, let's say an adolescent's in a hospital, chronic disease can't, 
you know, it could be a congenital heart defect, anything, right? Um, you always have to remember if they can get their best friend in would be the most important thing. I mean, I don't know, because uh, when COVID came, I was teaching. But what did we do when COVID was here? Besides FaceTime, that's all they had. And it was a very difficult time for all age children and adults. So a mom's going to ask you, I, I think my kid's getting hormonal. My daughter's getting hormonal. Is she going through puberty? Well, you know, Tanner stages, and, and I put the, the picture of it here. You know, you could see if we're, the first stage that we're going to see in children is we're going to see those breast buds. That's number one. So we know we have started going through, you know, puberty. And it really gives them that. I mean, I don't know if any males are going to tell you that, you know, the, the testicles are getting bigger. I don't know if a, male, a little boy will tell his mommy about that. But that would be when we look at um, boys. One of the concerns adolescents is some of them are sexually active. Um, uh, many times they don't want mommy to know because, you know, they're their perfect little angels and they don't do those things, right? And as nurses, we cannot say, no, you should be uh, abstinent because they're going to do what they want. So what is our job as a nurse? And, it, and we all have our own cultural, religious beliefs, right? We got to Yes, we got to shed that and we need to educate it. And we educate that by oral and written form, right? And only what's real, not your feelings. Um, and, you know, you, telling them what's good about them, the risks of them. I mean, they think a pill is a solve all, but, you know, we also need to teach them about getting sexually transmitted diseases. And even though with a pill, condoms, right? These are things we must teach our adolescents. And sometimes some nurses have a hard time doing that. Um, that might be, hey, you have a friend who's a nurse too. Maybe they need to speak to the kid. They can speak easier. They used to always put me in those rooms. You know, I was <laughs> a parent of adolescents, you know, and again, kick the mother, father out, talk to the child, get on their level, you know, open it up and listen to them. Um, Sometimes they're going to tell you things and it's like, I don't believe they just told me that. But try to keep that straight face because that's what they're trying to do. And again, just counsel them on the benefits and risks. Now, Piaget is all about thinking, cognitive. Uh, we know nutrition helps with that for sure. But cognitive is all about figuring things out. <clears throat> how do I get from here to there the shortest way? Or how do I take this thing and put it together and make it work? All of those things. It starts out with, you took your teddy bear and you put it underneath a blankie and they can't see it. Well, that kid, even infants, they know to go looking for it. And that is called object permanence. And object permanence is that you put the toys away at night, that kid knows in the morning, they know where to grab them, right? And take them right out. Object for minutes is important. Erickson, you definitely kind of see Erickson here. Infants, you trust versus mistrust. They know if they cry, somebody's gonna get them and then their needs are met. It's when nobody comes for them, they're not met and that's the mistrust. School age children, well, industry is that what they do well. Now, as nurses, especially if you have a child who's a school-age child who's there for longer periods of time for whatever illness, we need to give them things that challenge them, but you know they'll be able to do in the end. They need to be able to accomplish what you give them. Maybe you give them a puzzle to do, and it's, you know, 500 pieces, not those 5,000 piece one, right? But something that you know that they'll be able to finish and then they have a sense of accomplishment. Very important school age, whenever you give them a task that doesn't have to be easy, but they have to be able to accomplish. They should be able to do that task. And adolescence is all about me. What do I look like? I'm too fat, too skinny, too many pimples, right? My hair is too curly, too straight. 
whatever, body image, you know, identity, who am I? And that could be in any level of identity. Do I like girls? Do I like boys? What do I be when I, what do I want to be when I grow up? You know, all of those things. Where do I want to go to school, college, all of those. That's all identity. And um, they're always, again, that body image. And as I said, with adolescents, to be able to speak to them, you, I would never talk in front of my parents. My mother, oh my goodness, I'd be like put on lockdown for years. And she would have. So I wouldn't have said anything. So I remember that speaking to these adolescents. Mom, could you leave for a little bit? Let me just talk to your child a little bit alone. Let me see what I can find out. Now, I'm not going to tell them what they said unless it is something that could hurt themselves or others. That's the only time. Mm -hmm. All right, let's run through some diagnoses here and some body parts. Hematology, let's start out with blood. Well, some of these things we don't think about. Well, you know, hemophilia is bleeding. It's all about bleeding and it's all about a factor missing, whether it's eight, nine, von Villebrons, platelets even, right? We know that, but what do we do for that toddler just diagnosed? What do toddlers do? They're falling down, bumping into things, scratching themselves, you know, how about that uh, dining room table? Their heads are just missing the edge. What if it's a sharp edge? What about that coffee table? Pad the furniture. You're not going to be able to stop them from running around. That's what toddlers do. I call them the dive bomb kids. We can stop some of their stuff that's going to hurt themselves. But again, keep them safe at home. What would we do for that child who is outside Trip fell, got their knee, hit a rock, and it's getting swollen. Well, it's just like we do for a sprain or a fracture. Rice, we're going to rest, ice, contain, and elevate. I had and, a question about that. Sure. Uh, on one of the case studies, they gave an example of someone having a compound fracture. And uh, the answer was rice. There, there are some other ones that seemed more plausible but I, I thought rice was just for basically a soft tissue injury or or you know well like there's in okay a compound fracture you got to be careful because you're talking an open fracture right but you need okay if you have a fracture in your ankle and you leave it sitting down there and not elevating it and icing it what's going to happen it's going to bleed 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 swell 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 cause more problems so you may not like, contain it as in tight, but you're going to try to stop the bleeding or um, pr protect the insides, right? Because it's open. So cover it as in, instead of contain, cover it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Nosebleed, how do we take care of it? Um, we're just going to take the finger, the thumb and the forefinger. We're going to hold it. And remember, lean them forward. You don't want to lean them back because you want to be able to have blood dribble out of their mouth. If you put it back, they're going to be swallowing blood. And what's going to happen? They're going to vomit the blood. So that's why you lean them forward and hold it. If it's still bleeding in 10 minutes, get them to medical care. They might need some cauterization or some other stuff done. I've actually, they put nose tampons in there to hold them in there. And, and it does work. Platelet counts are low. No, it doesn't mean that this is a kid with a bleeding coagulopathy from low platelets. <clears throat> Any patient, now platelets are there and sometimes because of sepsis infection, um, platelets are burnt up pretty quickly. And you could have a child with leukemia or on chemo or a child who's had overwhelming sepsis going on and their platelets are low. That is going to be my priority to watch and look for bleeding, right? And if they're alert enough, what am I going to do? I'm going to put them on bleeding precautions. What bleeding precautions would you put them on? In the hospital. Avoid aspirin and incense. Okay, yes. No IM injections. 
checking that CVC every day or as often as they're doing it, checking that platelet count, checking their gums, checking their urine, checking their stools, bruising, checking everywhere to see if there's bleeding that's actively going on. That's part of bleeding precautions. It's very similar to ITP, right? ITP is the same thing where bleeding precautions um, and uh, that's one thing that we do for them. Sickle cell disease. What is our biggest concern about sickle cell? Hydration. Like, and the reason is because those sickle cell clump up because the vessels are too small and it can't get through. And it's causing all of these cells to back up and it is painful but your number one priority is fluid. Dilate the vessel. Also, preventing sickle crises. If it's cold out, have them dress warmly so that we have those, um, you have this kid that now, excuse me, if you keep them warm, the, the cold will constrict vessels. And if it's warm, it keeps it open. And if they're out playing, we're definitely going to, um, that kid, we're gonna keep them hydrated, okay? Makes sense? So uh, what would be something that we wouldn't do for sick, that we would do? A kid has sickle cell, doesn't mean they can't play sports. It just means, of course, we're gonna see which one they play in, but to keep them hydrated. I mean, I live in Florida, so they should always have something with them. So acute lymphocytic leukemia, they are immunosuppressed. So if you're immunosuppressed, well, whether it is something like ALL, um, immunosuppressed sickle cell, um, lupus, or, um, JIA, um, all of these things, you're immunosuppressed. Our goal always is to prevent infections, right? Hand washing, number one. It's always an answer to a question, hand washing. And because they're so susceptible, let's put them in their own room so that we're not, even if the kid is a medical child, nothing's wrong, well, they could have a sniffle or they could give that kid something. So put them in a private room. And then let's do one of the anemias, iron deficient anemia. You know, children can take their medicines. Now, that iron stuff, it stains, right? So that's why we put it through a straw because it will get to the back of their throat. Also, sometimes we'll tell them, put it in orange juice. And why orange juice? Because it absorbs faster in the body. Yes, that's why- or vitamin it, C. It's the absorption, like the gastric acid in the stomach is where iron is used. That's where it's made into the, what is absorbed into the body because it's broken down by the acid. So yes, orange juice helps break it down and it could be used a, a lot easier by the body. Okay, JIA, orthopedics. Um, one of the things about um, JIA or any, uh, thing of the sort is um, getting children to understand what they need to do to take care of themselves. Now, JIA is a child who in the morning, it's hard to walk. They're stiff. I have um, adult rheumatoid arthritis. Getting up in the morning is like, I have to sit. I have to stretch. I have to stand up. Then I have to stretch and then slowly walk, a shuffling gait, wobbling. All of that stuff these kids have. One of the most important things with rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile idiopathic arthritis is to keep the joints moving. And one of the best ways that least wear and tear on the joints is a swimming pool. And that's why I've got one in my backyard. And my son, he has one. So I've been swimming every day that it hasn't been raining here. It's very, very important. Keep them moving. All right, you have a kid falls off the monkey bars. What are you going to do? Comes in complaining. 
My wrist hurts. What are you going to do? Mobilize it. Rice, right? Rice. Raise, ice, contain, elevate. That's always with any orthopedic injury, right? And because possible break, that capillary refill is the most important. I want to see is blood going or is it pale with no capillary refill? I can't see anything happening. And that would be an emergency. So always remember that. Scoliosis, the surgical treatment, and it's usually over 45 degrees of the angulation, they're going to do a surgical intervention, either Harrington or Luke rods. And they put metal rods on either side of the spinal column. Now, you're not perfectly straight, never, but you'll be closer to straight than you were before. When they're in right after surgery, because they've got these rods on their back, these children must be log rolled. You can understand why. You don't want to jostle them back and forth, rog roll them. You know, osteomyelitis, you know, some important information. We've already talked about some of the nutrition, fruits and vegetables, um, very important uh, protein for healing always. Um, and one of the things about osteomyelitis is because there might be something else going on. So finding out, has this kid been sick lately? Are there a lot of infections that kid's been in? And it might lead them to something autoimmune going on in that child, and it should be looked at. Cardiac, Kawasaki disease, how do we treat it? Aspirin. And one more thing. Intravenous immunoglobins. That's right. IVIG, because it's a viral infection. So you just give um, IV immunoglobins and aspirin. What's the aspirin used for? Mm. Yeah, inflammation. inflammation is one. What's the other? Bleeding. You want to stop clots. You want to get the blood thin. So to prevent clots and for inflammation. Yes, very, very good. What this kid looks like, you'll see the strawberry tongue. You'll see the peelings of the hands and feet, right? One of the things um, in these children is sometimes they've got fevers. They don't feel good. Again, these are young kids, usually three to five. I see a lot of Kawasaki. That's always been the age group. Make sure if they're not eating, find out what do they like to eat and then feed them those foods, okay? <laughs> this is not a point where you're gonna argue with it. You need to get nutrition in there. So what do they like? Feed them. They like macaroni and cheese and chicken nuggets. Fine, as long as they're eating, they're getting some nutrition in them. I can't remember what causes Kawasaki disease. It is a viral infection. And it is a multi-system vasculitis, inflammation of vessels all over. And it usually starts out, the kid's got a fever, doesn't feel good, it's an upper respiratory, or it's a viral, it's okay to go away. It takes seven to 10 days to diagnose it. These parents are usually exhausted by the time they get to an ER and we diagnose them. They are. And I'll take it, I'll look at their hands. I'm going, oh, there it is. We've got a little bit of blistering, a little bit on the soles of their feet and the palms of their hands. And it, you really can see it. And then look at their tongue, strawberry, and big red eyes. It's like I call glow in the dark eyes. I, I Very, very distinctive. Prostaglandins, what is it used for? To keep a PDA open. Yes, it is, very good. Uh, prostaglandins is what's normally there. Mommy secretes it in pregnancy. And that, that patent ductus arteriosus is fetal circulation. That fetal circulation stays open until you have the baby. Mommy's not there. No more prostaglandins. Usually it will close. One of the side effects of giving this is actually bradycardia. So if we are giving uh, prostaglandins, we just have to monitor their heart rate. 
and we can half a dose. It's a very slow, continuous infusion. Usually it's 0.1 mics per kilo per minute, to tell you the truth. You could go to 0 0.05 and it still works. The, the body tells you when you should slow it down. In the Mephison, when do I use that? Close the PDA. Close. Right, absolutely. <clears throat> now, in the Mephison is a medical treatment. It's actually an NSAID, Indocin, believe it or not, but it's an IV form. And there's three doses we give. How do you know it's working? Now, I can tell just by some assessments. When that PDA is open, it's a washer machine type of murmur. You hear, you hear that extra flow going on, okay? If that endomethacin is working, I'm not gonna hear it anymore, right? The other thing is when you have an open PDA on it and they're newborns, blood pressure 60 over 40, normal for a newborn. You might see 60 over 18. Why pulse pressure? As the endomethacin works, that bottom diastolic number will go back to 30 something 40. And then again, you know it worked. But it's that murmur, that one that we really can tell. Unless you do have a central line in and you're getting blood pressures. All right, congenital heart disease. Um, child's not doing well. What would you see with a child with um, congenital heart disease and that heart's not working good? Because remember, there's all different sort of conditions that can happen. Fluid overload. Right, right. So what would you be assessing? Respiratory status. And that's, listen, is there fluid building up in the lungs? Also, you might see them getting tired out during feeding and they're not finishing it. Breathing faster, right? You might see them when you put them on the scale uh, they gained eight ounces yesterday. That's all fluid. So remember, weights are always golden to look at. Anything has to do with fluid. Fluid balance, um, daily weights, intake output. Always remember that. And Why would it be decreased BP and not increased? Because the heart can't work good against pushing against it. You'll see tachycardia, but the heart's failing. You already have a congenital heart disease. Cardiac catheterization. What do you worry about with cardiac catheterizations? You just get the kid back from cardiac cath. What are you worried about? Bleeding. Bleeding. So the first thing you're going to do is check the dressing. Well, what if happens if it's bleeding? What are you going to do? Pressure above the side. Right, because we want to see the site to look at it and we go closer to the heart and we can sit there. And of course you call the doctor, let them know, and then they could redo the pressure dressing and they can evaluate how much bleeding really was done. But our biggest concern is not die, none of those things. It's all about bleeding. That's your biggest concern. Now, you'll always see questions on digoxin. Digoxin in infants, it's really hard to tell, are they having a problem with it? Now, what are the things we do before? Well, it says here, I'm gonna check a heart rate. Now, you gotta know what's the normal heart rate for an infant or a toddler or a preschooler, right? And if it's too low, hmm, check for it. If we're in the hospital, you got a potassium level, absolutely. If it's low, you won't give it, or you're going to see um, ditch levels, right? Now, what if they're home? I've told my group, if you have an infant, younger child that can't tell you that they're nauseous, don't feel good, if they're vomiting, always think it's ditch toxicity and make sure that you count the apical pulse for one minute. Sometimes it becomes such a routine giving the Jackson, they stop doing it and it could be very dangerous, right? So vomiting, 
with no other reason, I would be, if they're in the hospital, I'll go back and check the latest levels. But if they're home, they need to call the doctor. And most likely they'll tell them to come in or hold the dose and then go in. Rheumatic fever, what causes it? What are some things that we can get uh, with rheumatic fever? What are those signs and symptoms? The redness in the eye, uvitis, uvitis. Nope, that's JIA. I did that again. You did it again. It's okay. Uh, You'll learn eventually. It's all right. Rheumatic <laughs> fever. Yeah, joint pain. Yes, nodules. They call it subcutaneous it nodules. Called, uh, kidney issues too, right? Rheumatic fever can cause glomerular nephritis. Yes, it can. That's the other thing strep throat can cause. Yes. What about pneumonia? Well, that sound with otitis media. No. Valve problems in the heart. That's the big thing. And everything else could be cured. Even the chorea, which is those really weird movements of the arms and the legs. You know, that usually when they got the fever, they've got all of a sudden this rash and stuff looking and they may still be complaining of a sore throat. You don't know. But when we determine that it is that strep, um, you could tell the parents, everything will go away except that heart valve damage. And it's usually your mitral valve. And then they're gonna have to go to cardiology, uh, do medical treatment, surgical treatment, whatever needs to be done for that. So that would be rheumatic fever. The urinary system, urinary tract infection. One of the big things that we might see, and you may not see anything else first, is all of a sudden a kid who was potty trained and didn't urinate in their bed at night, all of a sudden they're bedwetting. That's one of the symptoms. It could be that or diabetes, okay? So new onset bedwetting, think about it. It's not normal because once they're trained, they usually are trained. Cryptoorchidism, what is that? That's when the testes go in, so they don't descend. Right. So, I mean, if you were a male, you know, it is cold. The testicles suck up, right? They pull the testicles up to keep them warm. And when it's warm outside, they tend just to descend. So if we want to check a male infant's testicles, we want to get the best idea of are they distended? And it would please put them in a warm room. And that does help. Don't wash them, clean them, none of that stuff. Just have them in a warm room and then they can feel them. Another thing that you should ask is maybe the physician can't feel them this trip, but have they ever felt them before? That's a very important question to ask. Have you seen them distended at one time? And maybe this time they're not. Long-term antibiotics. I mean, we use that a lot for... Um, Problems with, you know, kidney infections, pyelonephritis. Um, a lot of times <clears throat> they're placed on vancomycin. Well, what do we know about vancomycin? It's an aminoglucoside. Aminoglucosides are extremely kidney toxic and they can affect hearing. Well, if you're on a long-term antibiotic and, you know, like let's say 10 days in the hospital, they were on this. One of the things that you're going to discharge teach is make sure that you count the wet diapers, right? And if they start having problems hearing, let them know because those are side effects from vancomycin. Another thing antibiotics we know is that nausea, vomiting, um, abdominal pain that can occur with it. And if they get that, have the parents tell um, the physician they might want to order a probiotic or something. Now, nephrotic syndrome, I'll say it again, has nothing to do with renal failure, nothing. Your kidneys are working. When it looks at protein, it goes, I don't like that stuff. And it just excretes it, excretes it, excretes it. So protein is vital, right? In the blood, it carries medicines around. And if there's no place to carry it, all these drugs are free in the blood. So your levels are gonna be really high. 
So we need to get that protein put back into the um, intravascular space, right? So how would we um, do that? Well, when that protein is really low, the, the blood doesn't have protein, so it doesn't hold fluid. It goes out interstitially in all the spaces. So these kids get full edema, eyes, tongue, you know, their faces, they gain weight, you know, they're full of fluid. So how do we treat this? Well, when it's getting pretty um, severe, the uh, more of an emergency treatment in the hospital was to give them some albumin. Now, albumin is 5% and 25%. And they'll give them the good stuff, the 25%. And then when they're done, they usually give them uh, furosemide after it. And what that does, it pulls all of the, not all, but a lot of fluid out of the interstitial space, puts it back in the blood system. And when you give that Lasix, what are you going to see? How do you know it's working? Well, number one, increased urinary output. That's your first thing you're going to see. And you're going to see the swelling, the edema go down. These children are on low salt, fluid restricted diets, right? And we usually just treat them with some steroids and that usually will work. These children need to be doing daily weights at home um, to make sure they're not gaining a lot. Now, hypospadias, hype, epispadias, this is all, they literally splay the penis open by, by this cartoon picture. And they open it up and make that opening go to the tip uh, of the penis instead of on top or on bottom. And it could be anywhere on top or bottom. It doesn't matter where. So remember, you need to keep the foreskin. They cannot take that off. They cannot be circumcised. They need that in order to do this repair. Now, postoperatively, there's gonna be a rigid type catheter in the penis. And it's there for seven to 10 days. We do nothing, you don't touch it, leave it alone. Put it in a diaper so that you're measuring urinary output. That's all you do with it. And then remember, these children, a lot of these, uh, it'll be done before they're potty trained. So a lot of these kids are up and walking and playing. Make sure, because they'll be going home, they're not in the hospital this whole time, that you do things to protect their penis, as in they're not going to be riding on their rocking horse or in a car or throwing balls or playing with stuff that can hurt their, you know, inadvertently hurt their penis. This would be puzzle time or coloring time for these kids. You need to really protect them. And as I said, that catheter, the, the urologist, the surgeon will be taking it out seven to, ten, seven to 10 days after. And they actually do really well. And it's, you know, they'll usually never know what happened. I mean, I had one student ask me, so does the penis still work after? Well, they know where all the nerves are. And they're not going to cut them inadvertently, you know, to create a problem for later on in life. Now, Wilms tumor, what do you know about it? Shouldn't push on it. Why? Because it can spread the cancer cells in the stomach. Yeah, yes, it can. Now, this is the reason they don't do any pre-op biopsy either. Did you think of that too? Because again, what are you doing? You're putting a hole in it, getting a piece to look at it. We know by where it's at. It's, it's a kidney tumor, okay? And it's big, it's big. Uh, the one that I saw was about this big, you know, a softball size and a little three-year-old kid. And he wasn't a big kid. Um, and it was in the left lower quadrant. And I was like, I didn't know why. I knew it was a Wilms tumor. And immediately, do not palpate abdomen. We don't want metastasis. But, you know, I never thought about not doing that biopsy before. They'll do radiation, chemo, surgery. These kids do well, great outcomes. Um, but it would be the same thing like manipulating it. No biopsies. Chronic kidney disease. One of our concerns is osteodystrophy. What is osteodystrophy?
Well, osteo is what? A bone. Dystrophy is something that's just not right. Could be a mal shape, shorter, crooked, one of those things. And it all has to do with erythropoietin, calcium, and vitamin D. These children, you would see them, their growth would be shorter, or they might have crooked bones, deformed bones because of it. So how do we prevent that? Erythropoietin makes the red blood cells, calcium, vitamin D, which is all good for bones. We mentioned it earlier, glomerular nephritis. <clears throat> Again, due to strep, um, glomerular nephritis, um, you know, the kidneys stop working. You, know, you stop urinating, blood pressure goes up. You're spewing, you know, that foamy type of urine that goes on there. Um, and we treat it again with just antibiotics and it does go away. And usually there's no untoward effects. One of the charts um, in the ER, there, there's a coding system. Orange is a trauma, red is emergency, and yellow is just, you know, a high level of acuity. But testicular pain is always a red chart. High level, it's worrisome. Why do we worry about testicular pain that much? Is it because of neural? Or could there be something there, pension? Usually it's a twisting. Oh. The testicles twist and they stop mm -hmm. getting blood flow. And then what would happen later on in life? No babies. No babies. Because you have destroyed a testicle. That's why it's an emergency. They'll do a urine. They'll do an ultrasound. They need surgery. Poof, right up to the OR. That's how emergent that is. It's very much like an incarcerated hernia. You get something twisted. You need to unopen it and get blood flow back now. Respiratory, epiglottitis. What's epiglottitis? Tell me what you know. Nose bleeds. No. Is it an infection no. of the epiglottis? Isn't that that little flap in the back of the throat? They come in with drooling. Yes, yes. It's All an right. emergency. It's an absolute emergency. Let me explain it clearly. So the epiglottis is there, covers the trachea when you swallow, so you don't inhale food into your lungs. Well, that epiglottis is what covers it. It gets inflamed, usually when croup is not treated. It inflames that flap, which covers that trachea. You can't pull air in. Inspiratory strider, nothing goes in. You can blow it out, but nothing goes in. You're, there'll be garbled speech. There'll be tripod position drooling. This is an emergency. So you don't have an airway. What equipment do you need at the bedside? Tray. Tray. Intubation. Yes, a tray tray and intubation tray. Absolutely, because you, if you, without an airway, you don't live. So they're going to do something to get that airway open. And it might be an emergency trait right there at the bedside. Asthma. One of the things that um, with asthma is children are not getting the medicine that's ordered. A lot of times it has to do with that little meter dose inhaler thing, right? And some people can't chew gum and walk, right? Well, some kids can't, even adults, push down and inhale at the same time. So if we have a kid who is not doing well with asthma, the first thing I'm gonna ask, what equipment are you using? Are you using a spacer? Like that boy down there has a spacer, puts it up against him, pushes it twice, breathes it in and out. Now he's gotten his medicine, right? Very important thing that we do um, ask. Now, let's go down to the croup now. I just told you croup untreated can lead to epiglottitis, right? Now, croup again is this barking, barking cough. This is a severe inflammation in the, um, the oral pharynx. One of the things that can happen 
if you now can't swallow, you're getting to epiglottitis. That is, you need to get that child to a doctor immediately. <clears throat> they, sometimes you'll have this kid in the hospital, you'll treat him, we'll give some racemic epi, which is epinephrine, but in an aerosol. And it goes right down to that oral pharynx and it decreases all that swelling in there. Let's say you get home and now the kid can't swallow. This kid, you need to call 911. You're getting close to epiglottitis. This kid's not gonna breathe, okay? So if they're not swallowing secretions, that's your emergency. RSV. What is RSV? This is an upper respiratory sort of virus infection. Well, for you and me, it's a common cold. Yeah. Now, for a little infant who already has a condition, you know, maybe premature, maybe has a cardiac condition, put a little mucus in that nasal airway, they can't breathe, right? So how do we treat it? It's a virus. Now, just the treatment of it is gonna be just suction the nose with saline and saline aerosols. That's all they need is infants. Now, if this is a child who is immunosuppressed, has other conditions, prematurity, congenital heart disease, those things, we're gonna be given this vaccine, Synergist, and it's monthly. And one of the things about putting these children, you know, you'll have two infants, both with RSV, and putting them in rooms together and like in a room placement, it's always check immunizations because what else could it be? What respiratory condition could it be, right? It could be pertussis if they don't have immunizations. So making sure that we know immunization status for placement um, is important. And again, treating, suctioning the nose out before they eat. And remember not overdoing it because then you create more. Now, respiratory distress in infants, when do you know you're getting really bad? <clears throat> now, they might get tachypnic, tachycardic at first, a little bit restless, but you start seeing their nose flaring and you start seeing the eh, eh at the end of every breath. That's an emergency. That scares me. Okay, and I don't get scared much. That scares me. Um, and of course, if you open them up to, to close off their course, they're going to be retracting like crazy. So respiratory distress, of course, we're going to treat it with whatever we need to, um, whether it be aerosols, it, it could be albuterol at this point. Um, again, positioning them. Cystic fibrosis, why do we do chest PT? To get rid of the mucus that Right, because it's like a big, thick Petri dish down there. And we want to get it loose and get it out. Why do we give enzymes? How do we give enzymes? Uh, well, 30 minutes before they eat. We're going to give it immediately before they eat or have snacks. And it's to help digest their food. They don't digest their fat very well. And um, these children are going to have um, stools that really don't smell good. And um, we need them to get as much nutrients as they can. So we give those enzymes to promote that. These children, um, if you lick their skin, and I'm not telling anybody ever to lick a child, but if you did, you would taste the salt. Remember, these children never ever take the salt shaker away. They need salt, okay? Because they're losing it through their pores. Their sodium chloride's going away. And albuterol, we know that's that difficulty breathing. They're struggling. It's like that RSV kid, they're gonna get their albuterol. Now, GI, well, we've already talked about it with the infant. If you have a kid who's having bad diarrhea, even older kids, they're not going to tell you that their butt hurts, right? So check it because you might have to put cream on it for them. I mean, infants is easy, but older kids, a lot of them like, they're not going to tell you about it. If you have a kid who's having abdominal pain, what are you going to ask them? What's important? Where is it? Describe the pain. 
where is it located? Is yeah. it a right lower quadrant? Is it a, an appendix? Or is it just maybe some diarrhea or you know heartburn? Is it in the belly button? I've seen a lot of those. And that's usually just you know a, a gastroenteritis type thing. <clears throat> you have a kid who's had abdominal surgery. You know, maybe they had an umbilical hernia repair or something. And all of a sudden they develop paralytic ileus. Now, how oh, it's paralytic ileus? Well, paralytic means that the intestines isn't moving. So everything's backing up all the secretions of the GI tract. And it's really bad. Colicky pain, nausea, vomiting. And then of course, nothing's moving down. So the belly blows up. Why do we get like a paralytic ileus from abdominal surgery? And the answer is because they're touching the intestines and the intestines don't like that manipulation and they just stop working. And we know even post-surgery, post-op, that stomach stops working for the first day. That's why we get them up, get them out, get them walking, right? So that we can have them pass gas, slowly introduce fluids when we can. Pyloric stenosis. What's the difference between pyloric stenosis and GERD? The projectile the, vomiting. That's the big thing. And remember, pyloric stenosis is that olive-sized mass. And it's right underneath the siphoid process, a little bit to the right, right in the center. And you can feel it. When I see it across the room, I put my hand up on that infant and I can feel it even when the mother's still holding them and I'm doing my assessment with just my fingertips. Antisusception. This is when that intestine sucks in. This is current jelly stool that you'll see. It's like a little explosion in the uh, underwear or in a diaper. So if a child is looking lethargic, which means they're getting serious now, usually dehydration, something's going on here make sure we stop feeding them and we get them hydrated. Remember, dehydration is always a concern in children. It is a deception, they'll do the ultrasound and they might need surgery. And the better hydrated, the better they do. So NPO and IV fluids. As you get older, we know reflux, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, you know, kids could be aspirating, you'll see them coughing, whatnot, but teaching them what to eat. I mean, many times you have parties at school and they have all of these icings and cakes and all that stuff. Sometimes a plain cookie is the best of all those choices for them. Bilillary atresia. What is that? Mm -hmm. It's when there's no connection between the common bile duct and the, the intestines. And that means the liver's backing up, okay? Biliary, bile, liver, think of that. What do you see? Bile's not going down. What does the liver do when it's not happy? It produces jaundice, right? Like hepatitis. You're gonna see them jaundice. You're gonna see the sclera, yeller, right? And then the urine be tea colored. And because there's no bile in the stool, it's going to be very pale. Those are classic signs of biliary atresia. Can you say one more time what it actually is? The bile duct doesn't connect to the common bile duct that empties into the intestines. There's no connection between the liver and the intestines. It's atresia, A without, it's nothing. So the bile just builds up in the liver. And that's where you get those liver sort of things, the sclera, the jaundice. Okay, makes sense? All right, neurological. Well, sometimes it could be as simple as you get a kid in complaining there's ringing in the ears. I mean, what's the first thing that you should do and look at? Always look inside. I've actually seen cockroaches inside ears before, oh. alive. And the, when they would move, the kids would, oh. and actually the one that I saw was a, a teenager. And it was hard for them to let me even look in their ear. 
it was yeah very scary but did they you know, have fever? <clears throat> excuse me did they have fever no no they just had this horrible feeling in their ears i mean we know kids today are listening to earbuds could be just something to do like that but always rule out something physical something in the ear and what they actually did is they put mineral oil in the ear and the bug floated up and out. And that's how we treated it. But we just took little clamps and got it. You have a child comes in, signs and symptoms of meningitis. What are we gonna get ready to do? And oh, that, absolutely. And um, remember, sometimes the younger kids just tell them that I'm gonna put you on the side and I'm gonna give you a big hug. And, and that works. It's, it works very well for kids. Remember, seizures is all about safety. We've gone over that the last exam. You know, talking, turn them on their side, remove stuff from their bed, anything sharp, head of the bed down, pad the side rails. Um, and very important, um, and that we teach our parents too. Um, another concern is those children with febrile seizures. You know, they say six months to six years. That's about their time frame, and they usually grow up and out of them which is great. My oldest grandson, he grew out of him. And parents are gonna say, all right, I got this kid, he's had the seizure. Do they have epilepsy now? Well, one seizure does not denote epilepsy. And that would have to be you know, more unprovoked without a fever um, seizure. And then they would work them up for that. Myelomeningocele, this is just what we covered and were uh, tested on. Myeloma and Gisele, what is your biggest concern? Skin integrity. Skin integrity and infection. Absolutely. We're going to get sterile normal saline, cover it with nice sterile dressing, and watch out about it. Now, remember this is the meninges, and this is the nerve spinal column pulled up and out of the body. So those lower extremities are gonna have decreased sensation and maybe none. So our biggest concern is urine and uh, bowel. Wow. Sure. Yeah, we kind of monitor it really, really closely. And we have learned from past history that all of these children will make latex allergy free. But you know, today they don't use latex in children's hospitals at all. I've not seen any. Duchenne muscular dystrophy. What do you know about it? An ex given to mom from mom to son. Mm -hmm. Right. And we know that if uh, and they're boys, ages three to five, seven, where we diagnose them, and there'll be progressive muscular loss. Um, we diagnose these children with what we call an EMG. And it's literally a little electrical shock given to a muscle that sees how quickly um, it contracts the muscle. And they can determine the weakness by that. Remember to tell those parents and child they're going to be uncomfortable when they come back. It's like going to the gym and working out without doing anything, okay? Eye injury, uh, something in the eye, worried about it, patch both eyes, get them to medical help. If it's something floating, you could take it with a tissue, but anything penetrating, get them to uh, either a, a pediatric ophthalmologist or to a, a pediatric ER to help them. Nystismus. We learned this in um, health assessment, right? Six cardinal positions of stage, of gaze. Um, we know that they're just not working the way that they should. Hydrocephalus, we use this for too much water in the brain, right? And what does the uh, VP shunt do? Drain it into the parent. Nursing care, what are you going to do? Check head circumference and uh, shunt every shift. And, and the abdominal guff also? Yes, yes. And remember that little pump, you never touch that. Leave it alone, it's only for the doctor. And we're, if it's a little baby, we can see their fontanelles too. Very good guys. So as these kids get older, what happens is the shunts disconnect. And again, this is another red chart. A VP shunt complaining of headache and vomiting. 
because there's pressure building up in the brain. We're trying to protect the brain, right? Now, they've gone to surgery. How do you know it's working? They don't have no more headache. There you go. They stop vomiting. Same thing. Yes. It could be as simple as that as the answer, okay? So we did surgery. We had to reconnect or replace whatever we did. The kid's feeling great today. No headache. We know it works. Endocrine system. Well, detecting or evaluating hypo hyperpituitaryism. Well, we know there's two lobes in the pituitary gland, and one's about growth, and one's all about fluid, right? So why do we do height and weight every visit? That's one thing we're looking for. Are they growing enough or not enough? And that can tell us very easily. It's these kids up till they're always, I mean, how many adult you go to your healthcare provider, your adult, how many times do they do height and weight on you? Hardly at all, right? But children, all the time, because we're looking for hypo hyperpituitarism. What does a parathyroid do? It secretes calcium or keeps the level steady. There you go. So what do you see when you don't have enough calcium? Your muscles don't work. You, you would just be, you know, just they, they wouldn't be moving. Right? Be world muscle weakness. Now, hyper, you'd have them in spasm. So too much, too little. Parathyroid, calcium. Whenever you see calcium, even magnesium, always think muscle, always. So DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Number one, what do we need to do? Number one priority. Check the sugar. Yeah, get the fluids. And we want to dilute it, right? It's just yeah. too hyperosmolar, it's called. But it's we need to get that sugar level spread out as far as we can, trying to get it down. It's very good. And then put them on that um, insulin drip, uh, slow and continuous, and we'll bring them down. So we want to do fluids first and then maintenance it with insulin drip? Absolutely, yes. Okay. So one of the things with diabetes in children, we want to keep them normal. So they could play sports, not a problem, but have them monitor blood sugars before they start. If it's too low, take a snack. Always have snacks with them and keep hydrated. I got a Remember? question on uh, the HESI review. <laughs> Tell yep. me that a five-year-old was capable of taking it, that the priority was teaching the five-year-old how to take the blood sugar instead Never. of counseling. But I don't see how a five-year-old could take their own blood sugar, honestly. Some can. I've seen it. I've seen six-year-olds with insulin pumps showing me how to give a bolus of insulin. You'd be surprised. Some can, some can't. And no, I agree with you. I was like, wow, but again. Yeah, I, mean, I, I picked food and counseling as I like, know I need to show them how to check their glucose or how to do it, how to do it themselves. It's, you know, it's always, again, it's this needle. <laughs> this needle's going to hurt me, you know? So, I mean, we're lucky today. They've got all these special thing dangles that we put it on once and we have our phones can regulate it. There's so much good stuff that's coming out now for diabetes. It's great. Remember diabetes to teach them to rotate the injections. You know, if you get the injection in the same spot all the time, you're gonna hear like a crunch when you put a needle in there. It, it causes the tissue to be damaged, okay? Signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, right off your last exam, right? Sweaty, shaky. I mean, sweating, profuse, shaky, jittery. Um, headaches, nausea, all of these things, signs of hypoglycemia. And children need to know what that is. And just have orange juice, milk, a hard sugar candy can hold them until they can get something. And there's been this question that students have told me about, about thyroid hormones. And I have, you know, for five years, I've been trying to figure it out. But it just comes down to, 
If your TSH is high, your T4 is low. And if your T4 is high, your TSH is low. Just as simple as that. And it has to do with breastfeeding or formula feeding. Um, and it was just something that nothing else made sense of, because the students always come to me, what about this question? So I just throw it in here, just in case you see it. Adolescents, you have the, a child, their BMI is really high. Um, what do you always worry about with adolescent who is um, the high BMI, either a little overweight or quite a bit overweight, and they start presenting with things like a urinary tract infection. Now, we can consider, yeah, it's a urinary tract infection, but if they are urinating a lot, it could be diabetes, right? So always check that hemoglobin A1C, a blood sugar, and of course, get a urine. And um, if they're also doing the polyuria thing too, um, check a urine. Those are things you might see. Common kid problems, in Pentago, um, there's one chapter on a lot of different kids' diagnoses that we don't really go into. So I do put some of this stuff in here. Um, and Pentago is, looks like that little boy's face and it will continue to spread. It is a staph infection. My grandson had it on the back of his leg and it went down behind his knee onto his calf. And his mother thought he was just itching a mosquito bite too much. So this is staph, it's contagious. You need to take oral antibiotics, usually cephalexin, Keflex, and Bactroban, that really good, oh, not over the counter, but prescription strength antibiotic ointment, both of them. And they say not to pop the fluid. 